thanks to everyone who's here today. So I'm looking forward to, uh, let's say, summarizing 50 years of experience in 30 minutes of presentation. I'm going to paint with a very broad brush, but one of the metaphors I'd like for you to think of is being an entomologist, I think of the insect eye, which is a very complex eye composed of many smaller ones referred to as simple eyes or omatidia. So what that insect sees is a mosaic. And the mosaic that I had is based upon my academic background, my professional background, and all the readings and exposure I've had over the last 50 years. So what I want to do today is introduce you to the concept of pesticides, the importance they, they bring to, to bear, and also the concerns that we should have for them in our society. But here you go. Uh, we always think of giving a presentation in terms of what you're gonna take away from this. And I want to emphasize very strongly here that there are really just two primary things that I want you to take away. I want, number one, to provide you with a broad view of pesticide history, development, and regulatory concerns. But the primary driving force behind pesticides is risk versus benefit. Just everything that's associated with pesticides is based upon that concept. Their invention, the, the methodology by which they're developed, the way they're marketed, the way they're sold, the way they're used, and the way you make a decision as to whether or not you wish to use these products. And if you decide that the benefit does not exceed the risk, please don't use the pesticide. So I want to emphasize that. They're very valuable tools, but you, everything about them is based on risk versus benefit. The second primary point that I want to discuss with you is what's a poison. This is something that I think that all of us deal with on a daily basis, and you don't see noxious worries referred to in terms of pesticides, but what is a poison? Everything is a poison. It's the dose that makes the poison, and I will discuss that in more depth as we proceed. Now, a little bit, of, very little bit of background about me to understand where I'm coming from and, and perhaps the way my vision has been, uh, has been molded over the course of my life. I was born in Virginia, born in Stafford County. It was a rural county when I left in 1968 with only 16,000 people. Now it's 160,000 and it's part of Northern Virginia. I received degrees from Lynchburg College in biology with a strong emphasis in chemistry. I then left for two years to serve Uncle Sam's request to, for, to fortify the military. And I returned to go to Virginia Tech for my PhD. And here I did my work on this plant. This is, is nodding a musk thistle. It is the first noxious weed identified as such in the United States. It was identified in 1918 in Nebraska, brought in from cattle shipped over from Europe. Without natural predators, pathogens, et cetera, it exploded. And as a result of that, the first noxious weed control act was passed in Nebraska. It moved to Virginia. It became a tremendous pest throughout the Blue Ridge, throughout the, the, the western portion of the state, such that in 1969, my first advisor, Dr. Rodney Hendrick, petitioned and acquired a grant from the Virginia Department of Agriculture to, to study the biological control of this plant. So my background is in biological control, as far as academics are concerned, and I worked with this insect. This is a, a weevil. Gen specifically, it's Rhinocillus conicus, but on the common name, it's called the thistle head weevil. Basically, it lays its eggs on the base of the thistle bloom, the larvae hatch, they burrow into the bloom, and they prevent the production of seeds. Now, this has been a phenomenal success. In 1969, uh, Dr. Hendrick released 100 of them on the farm of Bill Kegley in, in Pulaski County, Virginia. I have personally observed these weevils from the East Coast to the West Coast, North to the Arctic Circle, and South to Texas. I can recognize an infected th thistle plant at 70 miles per hour on the highway. And it's, it's really been quite an experience. And I can show you, uh, let's see here, Kathy, uh, what's going on again? I can't move it down. Hmm? Oh, here you go, okay. So anyhow, here, here we are at, uh, at uh, a long time ago, about 1983, in, in Flaming Gorge, Utah, and that's the thistle plant in my hand. That weevil is there. That initial genetic stock of 100 insects from Pulaski County, Virginia, is all over North America. However, when I completed my degrees, I looked towards academic for my professional career. And Kathy and I were looking seriously at Oregon State and Penn State when a small firm from Boston called me, a little company called Fison's, and they asked me if I would be interested in working for the industry. 
And I thought that to broaden my horizons, I would do this for a short period of time. Well, that short period of time became 21 years. And the, as these companies consolidated and they merged, et cetera, they all flowed into Bayer Crop Science. Today in the United States and in the world, the pesticide industry is a $25 billion industry. It's dominated by Bayer and by Syngenta. They own at least 40, maybe 50% of it. So what you see here is a massive evolution and consolidation of the industry driven, driven by the high cost of research and development for the development of new pesticides. It was quite a ride. In that, in that 20 year time period, I started out in research and development. I evolved to be a person of many talents. I, marketing, sales, licensing, diversification, malaria control, interaction with U.S. Agency for International Development, the World Health Organization, Panama Health Organization. It was kind of a circumstance with a small company that whenever there was a need, they would try to find someone to assign that to, and I became the person who did that. So I joined a company with four people in no sales, and I left in 1997 with a company with 40,000 people and four billion in sales. And so it was quite a ride. Pesticides. What do we know about pesticides and the damages that insects and other organisms do to, to man? Well, let's start in ancient history. The first documented case of true insect control is by ancient man. This has been found in the uh, caves in, in, in France, etc. And I'll show you a little picture of that in, in a few minutes and tell you more about it. But also the Romans. The Romans used to actually put dust in their stored grains. And they used this because they knew that it would keep the grains from being infested with stored grain insects. And then, of course, the next item that came out was natural botanical pesticides. So let's say early man, in these caves, we have found the, uh, the remnants of fires. And the postulation of the archaeologist is that man slept on the ground with a hide under him, and, and he put brush under that. And over time, insects developed quite a population in that, in that bedding such things as bed bugs, lice, and fleas. As a matter of fact, with the concern for Corona-19 today, it would be interesting to you to note that the bed bug that attacks man was believed to first evolve from a bed bug feeding on bats. But under the circumstances in which it was exposed to humans, a new species evolved that directly fed on humans. So man killed it by the use of fire. In the history of the development of pesticides, Homer talks about it in 1000 BC and the use of sulfur to fumigate homes. And latest, later, the Chinese writer talked about the use of mercury and arsenic for control of body lice and the use of a liliaceous plant for killing insect pests as well. So these were some pretty interesting approaches and there was no knowledge at this time about anything other than the acute effects on people there was no knowledge or no concern about the long-term or chronic effects. So what is a pesticide? The ultimate decision, definition by the Environmental Protection Agency's law, FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And this, of course, is the definition. Basically, if you make these claims for a product, you have a pesticide. I have spoken at places where people would say to me, I'm not using a pesticide, I just use soap to spray my plants. And to their surprise, they'll find out they're truly using a pesticide. If they bought it as soap and used it for their own purposes, that was fine. But if they bought it and it was sold for them for the purpose of killing those aphids, it is a pesticide. So anything that does this to the target organism is considered by FIFRA to be a pesticide. What are they? This is just a a short synopsis of the number of things that are truly called pesticides. And each one of them is specific to a unique uh, uh, area of application uh, from the true insecticides, which you're quite familiar with, to the pheromones. And the pheromones are chemical messengers used by insects. And we have actually used pheromones in a confusing technology to spray large areas of crops so that the females cannot be found by the males. And so consequently, you deny them the right to reproduce. The first uh, uh, insecticides were bot botanicals. Pyrethrums, rotenone, nicotine, and fly poison. Let me show you where these came from. 
Pyrethrums are all derived from a chrysanthemum flower in Kenya. Kenya produces probably 95 to 99% of the world's supply of pyrethrins. When you buy an aerosol that you use to knock an insect out of the air, it is pyrethrin, and it is synergized by a product called piperonyl butoxide. It's very fast acting, it's a nerve, neurotoxin, it kills the insect fast and doesn't last very long. However, later on, we modified pyrethrin to create a whole new family of insecticides, which I will tell you about later. Tobacco. Tobacco not only kills humans, it kills insects. And the nicotine is a very potent insecticide, and it too has produced a long array of, of pesticides. This plant you will see in big meadows up at the peaks of, uh, up at uh, on the Skyline Drive. Uh, man learned that you could take this plant, crush it, and put it in something like milk. Flies would be attracted to the milk, and it killed them uh, dramatically. That's reflected in the species name, fly toxin. These are the, your botanicals. However, the botanicals gave way to more, more harsh products, such as the use of kerosene for killing eggs and mites, hydrogen cyanide, and it's still used today for fumigating uh, collections of insects. And then along came London Purple, and, a, and our cynical product, which had long-term chronic buildup problems in the environment, lime sulfur, lead arsenate, et cetera. But there's a huge evolution of pesticides based upon uh, primarily some pretty toxic, nasty products. However, as we progressed, we began to look towards other types of products. Let me ask you first here, what is the most dangerous animal in the world other than man? To give you a little bit of hint, people die from malaria on an annual basis, 400 to 500,000 people annually. So I would put in my bid for the most dangerous animal in the world to be the Anopheles mosquito. Here's a female engorged upon her blood meal. And of course, the female mosquitoes transmit not only malaria, but a number of other uh, diseases, vectors they are. When did the synthetic pesticides begin to develop? 1939 was the origin of the synthetic pesticide arena when Paul Mueller discovered DDT as an insecticide. He revolutionized the use of, of chemistry to control insects. Comp it's quite an argument today whether DDT was an evil compound or a lifesaver. Here you see a soldier dusting a lady down in Italy in 1945. Here you see applications in a residential area in the United States. And here's the man who invented it, Mueller. Mueller actually won the Nobel Prize in 1948 for DDT. And uh, Sophia Loren talks about being 12 years old in Italy during World War II and having DDT blown up her skirt. This was used to control lice, which were transmitting typhus and the, the threat was for hundreds of thousands of people to die, but DDT stopped it in its tracks. Probably DDT saved more lives in World War II than did penicillin. But in 1973, it was banned by the Environmental Protection Agency. It's still in use for malaria, which is still one of the number one killers in the world by, driven by uh, animals. It has a long residual. It was cheap. And the World Health Organization says that DDT is responsible for between 500 million and a billion people being alive today. As a matter of fact, when you talk to the World Health Organization, you ask them what is their number one problem with DDT, they said 500 to 1 billion more people alive on this planet Earth. That's, that's how effective DDT was. However, like anything else, when you have something good going for you, you, you tend to use too much of it. 10 million pounds and 44, everywhere. No one really knew anything about the chronic effects of it. They just knew that it would kill their insects. It then led to a whole family of, R of, of new pesticides originating. It was a chlorinated hydrocarbon, more were developed. Then came organic phosphates, carbamates, synthetic pyrethroids derived upon that pyrethrin flower that I was telling you about, nicotinoids based upon nicotine, tobacco, fumigants, GABA receptor antagonist, another neurotoxin which blocked the neural impulse well, in the insect's nervous system. Chitin synthesis inhibitors, which prevented the insects from molting. Mitochondrial poisons and insect hormone mimics, a whole series of arrays. Let's just give you a brief breakdown of some of these. The chlorinated hydrocarbons were extremely beneficial products. And they, were, they blocked the sodium channel. 
when DDT is an insect treated with DDT, it will just shake itself to death as the nerve impulse continues to fire. Problem was they're extremely stable, remain in the environment for a long portion of time, but uh, long portion of time. They're water insoluble and they'd move into fatty tissue and be stored. The DDT banned it in 1973 and then began to attack other organochlorines in the late 70s and the 80s. The phosphates followed the chlorinated hydrocarbons. And here, a whole array of new products came out, much more toxic than DDT, but they were non-persistent and they broke down fairly quickly. They, the toxicity was due to their action in the nervous system, blocking acetylcholinesterase, which blocked the electrical transport along the, the nerve. The phosphates were followed by carbamates, same mode of action, very similar to organic phosphates. The difference was the lower mammalian toxicity, and, are, and they also had a wide spectrum of insect control. They're still in use today when you buy seven, Carborel, seven. Here came, then came the synthetic pyrethroids. You remember the flower, the chrysanthemum? chrysanthemum and the pyrethrin? Well, scientists learned that they could change the radicals attached to it and create a longer term product that was much more toxic. Very effective insecticides, extremely rapid, easily synergized, relatively low mammalian toxicity and a very minimal amount of residue degrading pretty quickly in the environment. So then came the neonicotinoids. This is what you hear about a lot today with the metacloprid, probably the largest volume pesticide used in the world. It's worked uh, virtually all the crops in the United States are treated heavily with imidacloprid as seed treatments. It is a uh, very, very, it's very toxic to bees. I am a beekeeper. I'm very concerned about that. And it's been blamed as the leading cause of colony collapse disorder. Extremely systemic, extremely effective, but with a very low human toxicity. Next group were the phenyl pyrazoles. And these products are again, attacked another component of the nervous system. And in doing such, it was a good neurotoxin, they're non-repellent, slow action, extremely useful for products such as uh, termiticides and things of that nature. 1962, in 1962, I have to, I can't possibly talk about pesticides without mentioning this lady. This is Rachel Carson. She wrote a book called Silent Spring. And I, I can show you this, I had the original copy of 1962, I've read it a half dozen times. This book revolutionized the concern for the environment. It was a seminal book on the concern for the ecosystem and the environment in general. It led to, the, to John Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, establishing the Environmental Protection Agency. It led to the, to the banning of DDT. It was an incredible book, had a heavy impact, but it would never have been published had it been peer reviewed because she twisted the information in this book so much to prove her point about the negative aspects of pesticide that many of the people that she wrote about were quite upset with what she had to say, and which led to a flood of additional documents coming out like this, The Lies of Rachel Caution by J. Gordon Edwards of the University of California System. So her science was questionable, but the means that she generated in terms of producing an extreme awareness for pesticides and for a concern for not contaminating the environment led to a revolutionary chain of, of uh, actions taken to control pesticides. These are the laws which we deal with on the federal level, the most important one being the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. It controls the registration, labeling, et cetera. And then later we built on that with the Food Quality Protection Act. But this is the basic law for all pesticides to be registered in the United States. So if you want to register pesticides in the United States, how do you proceed? The first thing you have to do is you have to go through the Environmental Protection Agency. You have to go through FIFRA. And when you do that, you can you go through several considerations, whether you are just an acutely toxic product that has no adverse effects and it just kills things. Soap might be a good example of that. And the EPA will say, okay, tier one is fine. We're just gonna ask you to do some acute studies. We'll grant you a registration. Time to do that two years. But if you go to the next level where you have chronic implications associated with long-term problems such as cancer production and things of this nature, it becomes very, very complicated and it could take you 10 years to get that registration. And it could also take you $100 million to, to conduct all the tests necessary to do that. 
And then after you go through the federal government, you then have to register your product at the state level. I may have mentioned to you earlier, that's why I'm in Virginia today. I was recruited by the state of Virginia in the year 2004 to come down and run the Virginia Pesticide Program. So I spent four years regulating pesticides for the state of Virginia. One more time, I'm gonna emphasize, everything about pesticides is, de is dependent upon the risk versus the benefits. If the benefits exceed the risk, then go ahead. But if you're concerned about that risk, don't use it. That's all there is to it. They're highly effective uh, tools in, in what they're designed to do. EPA has an, has an actual formula for, for calculating the risk. And in that calculation, they will determine just what level of, of um, toxicity they can tolerate. Much of this is based upon the statement I said to you earlier as to what is a pesticide, everything is a pesticide. This der is derived from Paracelsus in the 16th century. He said, everything is a poison, nothing is without a poison, only the dose makes the poison. So the question is, is then, how about water? Is water a poison? The answer is yes. There's doc documented cases of people dying from the excessive consumption of water, which caused an electrolytic imbalance in heart attacks. Water can be a poison. Oxygen can be a poison. Anything in excessive dosages. That toxicity is measured in two fashions. The acute toxicity, the effect that it has immediately upon the living organism, and there's a very complicated formula in terms of the LD50. But basically, you're measuring how fast that product will work to kill something. Then you look to look at the chronic toxicity. This comes over long terms, and the types of things you can have is cancer, you can have uh, uh, birth defects, or you can have mut mut uh, mutations. So all of these are long-term chronic issues. How does the Environmental Protection Agency handle that? They demand that the registrant conduct a series of tests so that a risk standard can be produced. A negligible, negligible risk standard is established, providing no greater than one in one million chances of developing a cancer over the lifetime of a, uh, over a person's lifetime. And today, the FDA actually monitors pesticide residues in the food that you buy at the grocery store. Just to give you an idea of the toxicity of, of, of certain products in terms of acute toxicity, this, and the, I'm sorry, this is a cancer that I wanted to show you here. In the United States today, out of every 100 cancers, our diet's a primary problem. Tobacco, extremely heavy, but look where pesticides fit. Down here with uh, industrial chemicals and pesticides, they seem to just get more notoriety uh, when they do occur. And so consequently, we are more sensationalized by the presence of pesticide-derived cancer possibilities. Concern public perception. These are poisons, they're dangerous, chemistry, toxic. They kill things and the environmental contaminants. These are words I often hear used about them. But let's take a look at other toxicants in our environment. The aspirin, aspirin is an extremely toxic material. Did I take one every day? Metachlorpid, only half as, as toxic as, as aspirin. Glyphosate, which you know is Roundup. Look how relatively acutely toxic it is. Vinegar, acetic acid, table salt, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see, again, going back to Paracelsus, it's the dose that makes the poison. That's the critical factor that you have to consider. So what are the future hold? We are driven by the selection of new technologies through regulatory concern, the cost of developing it, possibility of getting it registered, and the relative safety and consumer acceptance, and then the economics. When I was in the industry, we had one successful pesticide for every 50,000 products that we screened. The success ratio was horrible, and that drove the consolidation of the industry. Where do you get these ideas? From existing products. Did you recall I told you about pyrethrins? Somebody looked at that and said, let's start adding a few different groups onto this pyrethrin molecule, and they came up with the pyrethroids. You're looking at patents. When people come up with a good idea, they patent it. So everybody looks at that patent and, and tries that product, but they also start building molecules around it. All sorts of research at the university levels, et cetera, people look at that, and that's led to a numerous uh, uh, plethora of pesticides. But it's all based upon basic knowledge of the tar target organism's physio physiology and behavioral characteristics. So you're trying to block something that's essential to the life of that target organism. What does it cost? In 2016, a new product cost $286 million to bring to registration, and it took 11 years. 
Now that's probably twice that. But again, it's a tremendous amount of money, 11 years to develop it. The, the pesticide industry has nine years to collect that money back. So that's why you see the high prices of pesticides. And of course, this is a breakdown of all the different components of this. I worked for a German company, and this shows only about eight breakdowns. We have had, of course, 20 breakdowns of the different stages of the product. Uh, <laughs> typically German structured approach to things. But we, we, were, we were pretty successful. We developed a number of products. However, we did go under, and that company is now owned by Bayer Chemical Corporation. When we submitted a registration to the Environmental Protection AG, that was a culmination of five to 10 years worth of work. And I think it is safe to say that more is, was known about that pesticide than most of the things we eat every day in our life. I mean, it's basically, we were scrutinized so excessively to make sure that it did not create an environmental hazard. What do I do with it? You give it to the EPA and you're hoping it registered. Now what drives pesticides in general? In general, it's, a, it's an, our need to feed a growing population of human beings. In 1950, when we only had 2.5 billion people uh, on the planet Earth, we could feed 1.7 people with every hectare, that's roughly two and a half acres of land. In, 19, in 2000, we were, we were squeezing that land, we were squeezing that land and able to generate enough food to raise, to feed four people. And we're continually trying to improve our yield and performances of products, et cetera, through the use of all technologies, including pesticide, because by the year 2050, we, we anticipate having 10 billion people on the planet Earth, and we're going to have to feed seven people from that same unit of land. So what about the land itself? Right now, on the planet Earth, we have about 3.6 billion acres of arable land. And if you look at that, a third of that land is, is totally unusable because it's deserts, glaciers, and mountains. Forests and steppes are 29, grasslands and prairies 26, and then you have about 3.6 billion acres of arable agricultural land. It's pretty tough to make any more of that land. With crop production, we're feeding the world with that 3.6 billion acres. The World Health Organization says that without crop product, uh, protection chemicals, you would need 9.6 billion acres. And if by the year 2025, to feed 8.5 billion people without crop protection, you would need 14.2 billion acres. So we're gonna squeeze this land for absolute maximum production so that we can, we can try to feed everyone. So I guess, Jim, it looks, looks like I'm coming to a close here, but I, people ask me, am I a proponent of pesticides? In my backyard, I, I really delight in, in having a very mixed, diversified ecosystem because of the number of caterpillars, moths, butterflies, and birds that I have out there. But do I use pesticides? Okay, this is a tree over at the uh, Glen Allen Post Office. It is heavily infested with, uh, with, with bagworms. If this were my tree, I would spray it with pesticide. <laughs> I wouldn't wait on biological control or anything of that nature because I'd want to save that tree. So I would take the risk of applying the pesticide for the benefit of, of preserving the life of my product. Now, so let's, let's go back. Let's go back, Kathy. Let me get you back to the first slide because I would welcome not only the questions that you're delivering today, but um, can you get me back to slide one? Not only the, the questions that you might have today, but if you want to get in touch with me, you can take down my uh, uh, email address and drop me a note. I'll be happy to respond to anything that, any questions that you might have, any uh, clarification you might have on anything that I've told you today, and, and mostly just to promote uh, a knowledge of pesticide. So with that, Jim, I'm open for questions. All right, Dr. Searles, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, so earlier in your presentation, you talked about a weevil. Uh, so we had a question, does that represent an invasive species threat? Okay. It, it, I would say to be absolutely correct with the terminology, it represents an exotic species because it did not occur in the United States. When we introduced it, we had to get that approved to the Animal Plant Health Inspection Services, the USDA, the EPA, it did not invade, we brought it over. Now, the thistle was an invasive species. It was brought over accidentally. So that's the differentiation between the two. 
Okay, very good. Uh, so another question that we had is um, asking about organic versus non-organic foods. So could you address that in terms of pesticide use for organic versus non-organic? I, I love this topic because uh, I'm, 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 my background is strong in chemistry. I don't know of any food that we eat that is not organic. Everything has to be organic, but we couldn't use it. We use minerals and vitamins that come in like salt, sodium chloride, et cetera. So I get into a real quandary when people talk about organic foods. And of course, our regulatory agencies are also dealing with that quandary. However, we've made a lot of progress. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people would stick a note on it and say it's organic. And what did that mean? It meant nothing because basically it was a promotional marketing thing. But it's meaningful today. It's meaningful today because our U.S. Department of Agriculture had put together a series of organic standards. And in order for a farmer to say that their products are USDA certified organic, they can only use OMRI certified products on that. OMRI is an organization called the Organic Materials Review Institute. And they publish a list of products that can be used in organic crops. <clears throat> are these products all organic? No, they're not. But Armory says that copper and zinc are acceptable products to use on these crops. So the EPA is watching these growers, checking them to make sure that the only thing they're using on the crops are organically certified products from Armory. And then they'll give it their good housekeeping seal of approval and call it an organic crop. Now, the major uh, uh, retailers such as Wegmans, such as Kmart, et cetera, I think you have, can have a high level of confidence when they say that it's organic, it is organic. It's USDA certified organic. Is that helpful? I believe so, Dr. Searle. Uh, let's see, we had a question here. Uh, can you comment on GMOs briefly? I'm sorry, on what? Uh, genetically modified organisms. Yeah, yeah. Um, agriculture, yeah. Yeah, Let, let's make sure we understand something here. Uh, the, the term GMO today has really moved into a whole evolutionary use. And it's really, when, it, when it's referred to, most people are referring to uh, uh, genetic modification through man-made insertion of genes or relocation of genes. And I, I make this distinction because 99% uh, of the food that you eat is GMO. Because everything that you, everything that you harvest or collect today, not even, almost all of it, I mean, for example, a wheat was found in the tomb of Tadankaman, and that wheat was still germinatable, but it doesn't look like anything that we have today. And what has happened is over that 2,000 years, we would used Darwinian Mendelian selection to genetically modify that wheat to what it is today. So when, in today's world, uh, when we, the GMO has taken on, well, more or less an ogre perspective, because we've now, since, since Watson and Crick, uh, uh, crack the double helix and, and the, uh, the genomes can be separated. We can slice out a specific gene and utilizing ballistic technology, insert that gene into the nucleus of a plant. That is what GMOs are thought about today to the extent that you know, Europe doesn't approve GMO uh, crops per se. Now in the United States, every acre of corn, well, I shouldn't say every, but probably 99% of the acres of corn and soybeans were all genetically modified. Are they harmful? Are they frightening, et cetera? Now, I would say this. Uh, they, as the, one, the genes that have been selected really could have been, uh, most of them could have been selected on the basis of Mendelian selection, and they would have been genetically modified. But it would have taken 20 or 30 years. But, but by pulling out that specific gene and inserting it into the plant, you speeded that up to two years to, to create a completely resistant plant. What do I personally think about GMOs? I want any of you, when you're driving down the road, to look at a field of corn or soybeans today. And this is what I don't like. When you look at that field of corn and soybeans, the only thing on that field is corn and soybeans. Nothing escapes. Because the, those corns are called Roundup Ready. They have a gene inserted in them to make them resistant to glyphosate or Roundup. So what's happened is the farmers have gotten lazy. Used to be for, for an acre of corn, you'd use 10 or 15 pounds of pesticides uh, to treat that joint, 15, 20 pesticides, and you still have escaped weeds. But today, a farmer buys genetically modified seed with the, with the Roundup tolerance built into it, and he uses two quarts of Roundup. 
and nothing grows in that crop except for the corn. However, nature abhors a vacuum. So what's taken place is that when you put lots more pressure on the weeds, they adapt to that. The first plant known to be resistant was Palmer amaranth in, in uh, North Carolina. Palmer amaranth will produce three million seeds. And so basically all you need is one resistant plant and the next year you got three million uh, plants resistant. So that was the first. But now we've got like 19 species and I don't know how many strains of plants that are completely tolerant to glyphosate, to Roundup. So my concern is that we made it easy for the farmers to control their weeds and some of them have fallen back into a relaxed mode and relied heavily on Roundup to take care of all the weed problems when they should be utilizing good practices and rotating their herbicides so that they can stave off the, the absolutely inevitable resistance that will develop. Yeah, that's it. Is there anything else you'd like to know about GMOs? Um, I would say this, I was very fortunate to come through this whole era and a gentleman from Cornell University developed a technology for inserting the gene and I, Gene and I actually worked with him and tried to license that gene for non-agricultural purposes. Uh, of course, uh, the DuPont landed it and they got it and they sub-licensed it to other people. But it was such an incredible technique. I mean, basically, uh, Tom took a, a, a micro particle of gold with crenulated surfaces, put bits of the genes on it and fired it into the nucleus of the, of, of the cell. And that is ballistic technology for the insertion of genes. And that is the most used form of genetic modification today. So it's really been a, a crazy ride seeing all this develop. Any other questions on that? Uh, yeah, we've got it. We get we got time for a few more. Uh, so, do you feel that the EPA is as strict as it was years ago? Um, you, you know, the reason why I accepted the position with the State Department of Agriculture in Virginia was that I had spent 21 years in the industry, and we didn't speak highly of the EPA. They were brutal to us. Uh, we were constantly debating with them. They were, they were amazingly critical and stiff. And uh, you had to be really careful what you said to them and make sure that whatever you provided them was solid scientific data so you could be prepared. I don't think they've changed at all. I think that if anything, they're even more critical. They're, they're really scrutinizing scientifically uh, your position when you submit a package for registration. So I don't think they've let up at all. Okay, we got time for, let's see, uh, we got time for one more, I believe. Uh, do you have any suggestions to uh, remove poison oak or poison sumac plants? Uh, I'm sorry, about poison sumac? Uh, any suggestions to remove those plants, poison oak or poison sumac? Uh, uh, you mean to the, the resin producing by poison sumac? sumac I think can't. the plants, actually. Oh, uh, well, um, Roundup will kill poison sumac. Uh, and, and so uh, if you spray it with Roundup, when it's green and growing, you'll kill it. So that would be a good technique. There are a no, number of other products, too. But pr frankly, the most benign of the herbicides that I would consider, I would use Roundup first and see. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, organical control. You could always cut it down. Frankly, I'd cut it down for me. <laughs> I'd cut it down. I wouldn't use a pesticide. But if I found that I had to use a herbicide, I'd start with Roundup. Any other questions? I think we're pretty much out of time. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Searles. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks to our sponsors at Bon Secours. Uh, thanks to all of you who came today to hear Dr. Searles' presentation. Uh, please join us next week, September 2nd at noon, uh, for author and historian Nicole Salomone, who will be presenting Goat's Gall and Alcohol, Popular and Quack Medicine of Early Modern England. You can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Stay curious.